Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. <laughs> Not so good morning. Okay, uh, my name is Marty Urich. Uh, I'm from the University of Washington, so I stand here before you as one of the people in the LSST data management team. And I know you must be thinking, I woke up at uh, 7.30 a.m. to listen about data management. Uh, but this actually is the, the thing that will allow you to use LSSD data. So LSSD is going to be a big machine. Uh, it will produce a tremendous amount of petabytes, and we want to reduce the catalogs. We need a lot, a lot of software, and we need a lot of people to write that software. And I'm going to talk about the plans for, for both. Um, so I'm really, really happy to see many people here who I know. Uh, lots of friends and faces I've seen over, over the past years, over the past uh, all hand years. But there are also many, many people here who are new. So what we decided to do here, um, the, the data management team, is to start off with a short overview and introduction status of the, of the of data management plans, um, talk about what data management is, what is it that we're going to do, um, and so that for those those of you who are new, you, you get a sense for it. Um, those of you who have already seen this slides, uh, these slides, I apologize, but there will be places where things have changed and I'll try to stress them. Um, and then we'll go through a series of, of uh, presentations by members of the data management team uh, talking about particular highlights from the last year or about certain plans that you might feel uh, that you might be interested about uh, for the, the year beyond um, and, and beyond that. So I'll start with the VM overview. Then Jim Bosch from Princeton is going to talk about algorithmic highlights uh, from the release that we're about to make. Uh, David Neidever, uh, University of Arizona slash LSST slash Tucson, right over there, is going to talk about uh, uh, what we plan to do in terms of uh, data quality assurance by processing real precursor data sets. Um, David Ciardi, represented here by this big screen TV, uh, he is going to be talking about uh, the user interfaces and data access. And then finally, Jonathan Sick will show you an experiment or an experimental thing we're trying to do with, uh, uh, with a forum type uh, application called Discourse that will hopefully make it easier for us to communicate internally but also to communicate with the entire community. And, uh, these app names that you see here, uh, some of them actually do correspond to Twitter, but they're not uh, meant to be Twitter names, they're, they're discourse names. So if you want to talk to us uh, on this course, this is what you can use, and Jonathan's going to, going to get to it. Okay, let me start this introduction of uh, what the data management of the LSSD project is. And I'll begin by just briefly summarizing what LSSD itself is. So LSST is a dedicated survey system. It's a wide, it'll cover more than half of this guy, deep, fast survey telescope that beginning 22 will repeatedly image the sky uh, for about 10 years. It's an integrated survey system. So the observatory, telescope, camera, uh, and data management, all the software and hardware to process the data, are all purpose built to support the LSSD service. So there is no PI mode, there will be no proposals, uh, no asking for time. So, in effect, the ultimate deliverable of, uh, of LSSD is not the telescope. We will all, well, not all, but a number of us are going to go to the telescope, but we're going to go there as tourists, not as observers. The, the real del deliverable is the fully reduced and raw data. So all science will come from surveying catalogs and images that we will access uh, via the computer and online. That data will be open. So all LSSD data, including images and catalogs, will be available with no proprietary period to the astronomical community of the US, Chile, and uh, international partners. Um, the alerts to variable sources, I'll speak about that in a second, will be available worldwide within 60 seconds. And then all the software that, uh, that these people who are going to introduce today uh, are going to be working on uh, will be freely available. It already is freely available and it will continue to be so. And the important thing is that all the science of LSST will be done by the community, uh, not the project, uh, using LSST data products. So LSST is really a system to enable science. And then when we take off all of us, our LSST hats, we as a community actually do uh, do the science. 
from a scientist's perspective, LST is a set of databases and data services. So every night, which is what the, these level one data products are, we will be producing a stream of up to 10 million time domain events uh, detected and transmitted to distribution networks within 60 seconds of observation. We will also be reducing that data to recognize and compute orbits for bodies in the solar system. We expect to have one order of six million of those, six to ten depending on, on what, uh, what model of the solar system we use to make predictions. Um, every year, we will generate a data release. We'll process all the data taken um, since the beginning of the survey um, self-consistently, same set of software, to maximum depth, maximum uh, fidelity, resulting in catalogs of billions of objects and trillions of observations. So by the end of the survey, these are the sorts of numbers we expect, around 40 billion objects and around uh, 10 trillion observations with 30 trillion measurements, uh, because for every object, we'll actually measure its position um, in every epoch, no matter whether it's found or not in that particular image. We will also make available deep co images, as well as all the individual images in raw data. And finally, there's level three. Uh, this is something that I think even David will touch upon. Um, these are services and computing resources at the data centers that enable users uh, custom analyses to run right next to the data. This is going to be a big data set. If you want to run some kind of reprocessing that we internally don't have a plan for, we will make it possible for you, for the community, to upload their codes to run where the data is and get that out quickly um, and uh, hopefully without too much pain. So, as you all know, the, uh, the, the machine is being built in Chile. I was really impressed yesterday uh, with, uh, with the photos from the summit. Uh, a number of us were there in, in April. Um, they just started digging, but there were no huge holes. Uh, now there's a huge hole there. Two years from now, there's going to be building with concrete. Build with concrete. Uh, but the data processing actually happens in the US. So we're going to have a data processing center at uh, NCSA in uh, Illinois. And so that means that we have to shift all those bits from Chile, essentially in real time, uh, to Illinois. And I'm really happy that we, we actually signed, uh, I don't know what the right term is, MOUs, MOAs, contracts, something. Basically, someone has promised to give us uh, two redundant 100 gigabit links from La Serena to Champaign, to Champaign, Illinois. So we will have the ability to lift those images, to lift the full focal plane uh, in, in tons better of order of a second. And uh, Jeff Cantor, Jeff, are you here? So a round, a round of applause for Jeff, because he's negotiated all these things. He data comes uh, into NCSA, uh, we will have our own dedicated single user, single application data center where all this is going to run. Um, this photo is showing uh, the Blue Waters cluster, uh, Blue Water supercomputer. It's currently the biggest, uh, I think the, still the biggest supercomputer that uh, NCSA is hosting. And our machine is going to be sitting right uh, next to it. So this is where all the alert processing uh, data releases and everything is going to be produced. The software, uh, the scientific core of data management is the software, the science of pipelines. So we will have the, the networks to bring data, we'll have the hardware. This is what we're going to run on the hardware. The, uh, the science pipelines include everything from uh, quote unquote simplest um, single frame processing to co addition to image referencing uh, to optimal fitting of, uh, of uh, model parameters on multi epoch data, etc. Uh, Jim Bosch is going to talk about uh, some highlights in, in the area of science pipelines uh, later on. These science pipelines are what we typically, uh, what we're very familiar with, uh, anyone who's observed here, when we go to a telescope, we download, uh, we get images from the telescope, we need to reduce them. So we fire up either something like S-Extractor or IRAP, and then run pipelines <coughs> manually. In, for LSST, this is not going to be possible because of both the real-time requirements and because of the, the volume of the data set. 
we will be running on a cluster that will consist of an order of 100,000 cores. So there will be 100,000 data reductions running simultaneously and extremely important to be able to do two things. One, to orchestrate all that processing. That is the top orchestration layer that our colleagues at NCSC are working on. And the other one is we're going to be running this machine for more than a decade. Hardware changes. Think about what you had a decade ago. I'll tell you what you didn't. An iPhone. So things really, really change in, 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 in that time span of years. And we want to be able to, to not to have to rewrite all, all the software every time hardware changes. And that's this middle layer that, that does the isolation that's uh, also being written by our colleagues at Slack and also our colleagues at NCSA. Once all that processing is finished, the results, the catalogs themselves, are going to be on a scale of a few petabytes. That is impossible to just put on your uh, you know, public HTML website. Um, it's very convenient after the first few terabytes. So we need to place that in a database. And our team at Slack is developing that database based on, on industry proven solutions like uh, MySQL and uh, on things like XRoot D that are, that are very well known in the particle physics community. So we will have that ability to, even though this is a massive data set, to, 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 to expose it to the user in a very, very simple way. And the final piece of, of that cake, if you will, is the SUI, the Science User Interface. The web interfaces, the, the machine accessible interfaces as well, to actually attach these databases, to query for data you're interested in, and to visualize it uh, right online. And David is going to be talking about uh, some of our plans for the, for the user interfaces. And I really, really encourage you to pay attention during that talk, because what, what he's going to be showing you is something that's um, that includes what people have done so far, but there are some components that are really, really new and that I think you'll find exciting. Um, so finally, the, 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 the last bit is making all of this work together and making sure that it, uh, it produces the data to the level of quality expected. And that is what our team in Tucson uh, is, is, uh, is responsible for and is is making sure that, uh, that, uh, that everything is done right. So uh, this is a completely um, uncontrived um, abbreviation, square, science, QA, and reliability, reliability engineering, um, led by uh, Frosty Economo and uh, David Neidberg. David will talk a little bit about what kinds of uh, processings of real data sets we are, we're considering at the moment, because I think what would be really interesting with all this, all the system that's being built is to show even before LSST is in the sky that it can work, um, that it is the, the state of the art thing to apply even on real telescopes. I think that will really build confidence that uh, when we have LSST on the sky, uh, it, uh, it will work. So let's go back to this. This is what LSST is from the scientist's perspective. I'll go into one level of detail uh, beyond this. So what <coughs> is included in level one and what is included in level two? Level one are transient alerts. Um, LSST computing is right now sized for about 10 million, 10 million alerts per night on average, and uh, 10,000 alerts per visit. So the challenge there, as always, is image differencing um, and false positives. And we will have about, uh, well, essentially seven years of development to, to make sure we, we, we reduce that uh, to, to a degree uh, to maximum degree possible. But once the images are different and objects detected on each individual image, what we will do is we'll transmit alerts. And each alert will consist of a lot of information. So for one thing, within 60 seconds of observation, we will give you, for every object that appear there, we'll give you its position, its uh, flux, piece of flux, size, and shape, uh, its uh, light curves in uh, all bands up to a year. So we'll go back into the database, cross-match it in real time to, to what we've already seen, and transmit the entire light curve. We'll characterize that variability. Um, we're still understanding what are the best ways to, 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 to characterize it. So what kinds of, for example, low order light curve moments we can give you, uh, the probability that the object is variable, but what will be the most useful thing? That those are the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about with the community for the, over the next couple of years. And then cutouts centered on the object. 
So the idea is, in essence, when we transmit this alert in level one, uh, you will have all the information, everything that LSST knows about the object. You'll be able to make a decision whether this is an interesting object or not, and uh, point your big telescope uh, with, a, with a big spectrum to have to follow it up or not. I, I'm showing this slide to give you a sense of how both interesting and complex this process is. If you like putting together Ruth Goldberg machines, it's very interesting. Uh, but this is really the simplest it can get. Uh, so what happens in the 60 seconds? So we start with an observation. Uh, we have each LSST visit is comprised of two sub-visits or two sub-exposures that we call snaps. So each LSST visit is in effectively a 30-second exposure, but it's split into two 15-second exposures that are, um, that are done back-to-back. -back. So you do the first 15-second exposure. That's about 15 seconds up there. And then while that's running, we fire up um, two things. One is the, the night mops pipeline, which is the pipeline that tells us where all the known asteroids are. And the other one is the computing system starts fetching templates uh, for differencing, for image differencing of, uh, of that incoming data. Then you read it out. Read out takes uh, uh, two seconds. We transmit it uh, to NCSA. So it's, go it's going all the way to US. It's, so at this point, it's going to La Serena, the transmit. And then at this point, it's, it gets compressed, so it goes all the way to the US. This is just the first. Yeah, just the first snap. And then we, we do some initial first snap processing in the US right away. At the same time, the second snap gets taken, and you see the same, the same pattern. It's an it's a exposure. So um, everything down there happens in the US. Uh, there are some smaller things that happen in Chile, but to, to zero order, first order, everything happens in the US. So when we do the second snap, it gets acquired read out, uh, transmitted to the US, same thing. But when that readout finishes um, of the second snap, then that's our t equals 0 for the 60 second uh, transmission. So this is where, our, where, where the clock starts ticking. So now it becomes really important to, to get things done fast. Thank you. Great. So we transmit the second snap as well. And now we have all the data in the US. And these numbers here are actually fairly conservative. We think we can do this uh, faster given the, the, the internet that we give the value that we have now. But this is, this is now where the difficult part starts. Image processing. We start with image characterization and differencing. Then at that point, by that point, the predictions of where the asteroids are have been made. And we can go and associate known, as known objects on this image with asteroids with known objects previously seen in the database. At the same time, a number of quality, automated quality assessment metrics are being computed. We start generating these alerts because when after we've done the size characterization, we actually, there's a somewhat non-trivial um, amount of work to, to package them correctly and, and send them out. We, this information also gets included in here. And then at the same time as this is getting done at the, in the US, a new visit is, is acquired in Chile because this telescope uh, you know, never sleeps unless it's a day. And so you have a problem, right? Because we're here up, up close up to our, uh, um, closing in on our 60 second deadline, but the new visit has already been acquired. So if we now wait for this pipeline to finish, there's a huge gap when nothing, is, nothing gets done, and we will lose a 60 second, um, we would go over the 60 second deadline. So what we do is we run these in parallel, multiple pipelines. So at the same time, this is what we call string one. This runs in one set of one batch of computers, and this one here will fire up on another batch of computers to capture and process this visit. So we kind of go back and forth between string one and string two as the visits are coming in. So third visit would go back to this one, and this happens through the night, uh, 300 nights a day uh, for 10 years. There are, there are some very, very interesting technical details of how you do this, how you make this reliable, and what happens when you try to do image differencing in the galactic plane. Um, OK, 
can it may take us more than one string. So for how many cores are each string? How much? Oh, I'm looking at our system architect. Do we have an, an estimate? Can you repeat the question? How many cores uh, are occupied by each string? So what is the computational intensity of this processing? Yeah. Um, the number of cores specifically that it is a little bit tricky to come out, but give you like a fair approximation. All right. Well, Katie will find a number and tell us to do the next about 40 teraflops. So 40 across, teraflops across the two screens. So it's, it's, not, it's not a huge amount of, of computing. Uh, which is actually actually good because it gives us some, some leeway in case we want to do something more complex. Um, so that is level one. Level two, the data releases, those will give you well calibrated, consistently processed catalogs and images. Uh, we will make them available once a year, except in the first year. So for the first year of data, there will be two data releases, six months apart. Um, and these will include complete reprocessing of all data for each data release. Um, so that means that we will benefit from improvements in software, improvements in understanding of the telescope, uh, the, the camera system, improvements in calibrations, uh, et cetera. And I already mentioned these numbers, but these are projected catalog sizes. And the, the thing that's always interesting to me is note that this is not linear, right? That this increase. So we go, we jump to 18 billion objects essentially in you know, approximately. In, uh, in data release one, and then we go, we double that number by by data release eleven. And part of the reason why that happens is that LSD is fairly deep, and at some point, in essence, you run out of stars in the Milky Way. So we, we quickly map um, some of the some of the closest uh, 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 portions of the Milky Way, and this is where all these objects come come in. And then for the galaxies, it it takes uh, longer to get a bigger sample. What is going to be in these catalogs? Um, roughly, if you try to find an analog, uh, think of SDSS. It's not surprising since our, our science pipeline's um, architect is Robert Lupton, who may or may not be here. Um, there he is, um, who is uh, who's the guru of SDSS. So we, we brought a lot of heritage over from there. But we will have some key differences compared to SDSS. Um, one big key difference is that for the galaxies, or I should actually say for, for extended sources, the way we're going to, to fit models to them, uh, or the way or the information we're going to capture, is going to be much, much richer than information that's been traditionally captured in previous surveys. So we'll actually try to not just to do maximum likelihood and write out maximum likelihood plus some estimate um, of, of the RMS error around, around the, that peak. But we will sample the entire posterior of the distribution of that uh, for, for the entire, actually, I should, I should say posterior, I should say likelihood. We will sample the likelihood surface, store those samples in the database. So, depending on your science case, you can take different priors, uh, combine them with the likelihoods that, that we have, and push your, your measurements really to the systematic limits uh, of what's possible instead of having to assume. Uh, simplified uh, instead of having to do simplified models. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. So if you thought of traditional astronomers, I would guess that the first question to ask after what you just said is, how do I make my classical color magnitude diagram? All of that will be in the database as well. So everything, the, the things of that sort, we will pre-compute them with priors that we feel are reasonable. For my guess is that for a very, very large number of science cases, that's going to be more than enough. But if you really do have a science case that sensitively depends on your assumptions, we will retain the information, which is basically this, that allows you to incorporate those assumptions into, into data analysis and not have to go with hours. So uh, that's a very good point. I, I don't want to, to make anyone uh, think that this is going to be, become necessarily more complicated for everyone. It's, it's if you need that degree of complexity, we'll make it available for you. Uh, we'll also do non-parametric object characterization. Uh, here is a list of uh, uh, measure colors, um, compute some variability statistics. So this should be a very, very rich data set. Um, and let me skip over to this slide quickly. To find out more about this, we are actually 
we, we, we think we have a very good idea of uh, what this cow is going to consist about, but there is still a lot of room to optimize uh, the exact details. So I would encourage uh, people here, if they want to get familiar with what we're planning to produce, to go and download and take a look at this document. So the, the, the memorable sort of uh, URL is ls.st slash dpdd. DPDD stands for Data Product Definition Document. It's a document where we try to write down uh, exactly what data products we're going to deliver, what is the philosophy behind it, and for what purpose, and we periodically update it. So we'll have another update of it uh, in, in a couple of months. But this is the, 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 the place to go if you want to learn more about data products. Um, let me go and talk about the status of the subsystem. So DM has, we are starting construction, but, but we've worked really long and really hard in, in, in uh, research and development to get to this point. And there's already a tremendous amount of both knowledge and actual code uh, that's been written. We periodically, every six months, make releases, which are essentially points in time where we make sure that the code is more stable than, uh, um, than any given day. And uh, we write down the release notes and make it available to anyone who wants to use it. So in winter 20, we have two releases this year. Actually, we, we had one release this year, and we will have another one uh, coming in September. Winter 2015, uh, that's been cut back in March. And uh, summer 2015, that's coming in September. In winter 15, we focused uh, on, let's say, housekeeping. Uh, so refactoring, the design prototypes into manageable production code, um, the kinds of things that are less visible from the outside are really necessary. Now summer 2015 is going to be very interesting because there we'll have lots of new functionality including uh, incorporating many, many algorithms that were developed and tested on HyperSoprancan uh, data for the HyperSoprancan survey. So I'll go briefly to, to, through what, uh, what is done in, in each area. So in the area of middleware and control, remember, remember that sandwich with science pipelines in the middle and then these two things that are um, orchestrating and making, making sure that they're, they're possible to run. That's middleware. Um, we've done an, a simulation of alert production. So the, the, the diagram that I showed you is a simplified version of that. Um, communications to observatory control systems. Uh, we've, we've changed the way we do logging and we started working on uh, process control on, on how to manage uh, this, this all this execution. The database, our database called QSER, DAX has nothing to do with Babylon 5. Um, it's a data access, I believe, just data access, right? Um, QSER prototype is turning into really a good, solid, maintainable code base. Um, Multi node deployment and execution. Uh, has been implemented, so we can, we're starting to get to a point where we can reliably run, run that big database at scale. And we're really starting to work on communication between that database and uh, web service, and web services that are going to be, uh, such as the, the user interface, uh, to which we might be accessing it. The science user interface, I'll actually just skip this slide, uh, because David is going to talk a lot, lot more about it, and we're really excited about this kind of thing there. Science quality. Uh, the way we know how we're making progress is by measuring when we reduce data, um, how well are we doing on a set of key performance metrics. So if those include uh, things like relative astrometry, absolute astrometry, um, various measures of, photo, of uh, photometric fidelity. Um, David Neidever is going to talk a little bit more about that, what we're, what we're planning there. Um, there were, there was a lot of work in, uh, in, in kind of, um, um, in the area of the science pipeline to do internal improvements. But one of the externally, uh, one thing that's externally visible is that we started modeling interesting behaviors that we see in our sensors, or that we've now recognized in our sensors. And that is going to continue. And uh, Jim may have a little bit more to say about that. Um, then moving up, with summer 2015, this is what we will have. We'll have aperture corrections implemented and verified. We brought in as an option uh, PSFX code uh, from manual 10. Uh, that modeling has been incorporated into LSSD stack. 
we're able to compute, to measure and compute C model magnitudes. So if, uh, if you're familiar with SDSS, it is exactly the same algorithm. We have a, a much improved model for fitting backgrounds that leads to better measurements all across the board here and improving for handling of fixed files. But I think this is probably one of the, one of the most significant improvements. Um, we now have the ability to do multi-bed processing for coax. Uh, detect on each band, merge footprints, the blend measure each band, merge catalogs, choosing the, and choosing the reference band. So this is where we are going beyond what's currently out there. Um, and uh, Jim has a, has a whole talk on this. And this is, I think, really exciting and just going to get better. So that is sort of where we are. We're going to hear more about the details soon. Um, let me tell you about where we're going. So this is my annual conversation with the universe. It's been going on for a while. My doctor's worried about it. <laughs> so I wake up in the morning and say, universe, prepare to be digitized. And the universe doesn't care. <laughs> so I'm persistent. And I say, yeah, I'm going to digitize you starting in seven years. And the universe in my head says, yeah, right. You and what army? And at that point, I get really depressed. So that's been going on for a while now. I said my doctor was worried. But interesting things have happened over the past year. One, every year, I would say this, the more I waited, the, 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 the larger this number would become. Uh, <laughs> this year, it started ticking in the other direction, which is awesome and scary at the same time. And the other one is this part. We've, in R&D, we've had a really, really good, but really, really small team. And 2015, this year, with all the technical improvements that I've showed you, but this year was really the year when we were staffing up, when we were putting that, that, that team together and sending it. It was a huge effort by the technical leads of all the in groups. It's, it's, it's a very, very difficult to find um, you know, on, on, on order of, of 25 and higher, on order of 25 or so, you know, top of the line people in all these areas. So I'd really like to thank um, all of them for, for reading hundreds and hundreds of applications and doing hundreds of interviews. Um, if you're here again. <laughs> so next year we, we are entering, uh, we're entering next year with a team that's more than double. So development on all fronts will really accelerate and you will see that. We're still looking for more. We will have open positions. So I really encourage you, if you know someone who likes this kind of work, uh, please let them tell them to look at uh, the job register um, and, and to, to apply. There are many, many new faces in the team. Um, and I just want to briefly go through, through all of them. So this is going east to west. Uh, this is our group of Princeton. I think we don't have photos for everyone, so I apologize. But when I put up a slide, could you just stand up? Princeton guys. All right. So they are responsible, or they will get. Oh, Jim, you can do that. <laughs> so the Princeton group is working on the details of, of level two processing of science pipelines, the so systematics limited measurements. And the reason why I'm going to ask everyone to stand up is if you find this interesting, they're the people you want to talk to and collaborate with because a lot of this is going to be interesting for science very soon. Paul, you, Robert, you can't avoid questions by sitting down. I <laughs> <laughs> And Robert. Well, he's embarrassed about the test map. that doesn't want to talk about 60 or that. Let me move on. Um, NCSA, we've had, uh, we, we, we've really uh, enlarged the team at NCSA. I think Margaret is here, Jason Alf is here. Uh, we need to get your photos as well. Um, Don Petravic, who's, who's the lead of NCSA, couldn't unfortunately be here this week, but uh, NCSA folks, where are you? All right, so if you are interested in, in uh, things like middleware processing, um, how to make, if you're building a big survey, you want to use something like analysis key code, how to make that, that happen, there are people to talk to, um, as well as how to apply analysis key codes on, on other surveys, precursor surveys. Tucson. Tucson, where are my former local colleagues? Uh, the Tucson team has really expanded. I think we've, we've essentially gone to, from zero to full team uh, over the next uh, 12 or so months. 
Um, and the Tucson team is really going to be doing a lot of the, the data quality assessment and, and the processing needed for that. In addition to the outreach to the community, um, as, as well as documentation and everything that's needed for this to, to actually function smoothly. Um, IPAC, the IPAC group, IPAC group is working on the user interfaces, um, and they will be uh, um, they will be demoing the, the, some really good work that they've done on a, on a fairly short notice, and that will continue. As I said, we essentially this is an entirely new group compared to about 12 plus epsilon months ago. Um, so we're all getting together, and finally, not quite finally yet, and Slack. Slack is doing the database in the middleware. Uh, when they're not rebuilding really old computers in their basements. <laughs> you can talk to Fitz about that. Uh, and finally, uh, UW, uh, UW will be working on the on real-time, uh, the first order of everything real-time uh, in the science pipelines. So image differencing, alerts, um, understanding, uh, solar, the solar system, and is uh, the UW group here. All right, thanks for being here. So, I hope you remember everyone. Um, but, but I thought this was really important because this team is not just a team that's building a piece of software. They're really excellent scientists who know how to use it. Um, so I think this is going to be, be much, be very interesting in the future uh, because we want to apply these, these kinds of codes to existing uh, to prior data sets. Um, and my guess is that science collaborations are going to start are going to start to becoming interested in that as well. And then these are the folks uh, who I think you will want to talk to. And then finally, I'll let me mention a few new roles. Uh, start from the bottom. Tim Janess has been uh, hired as a deputy system architect in Tucson. Uh, Tim is somewhere here. Tim is there. He, he comes with a lot of experience into, into this role and uh, passion for Python 3. Uh, and KT Lim, uh, our, our system architect, uh, has also been named the project engineer, uh, which means he has by far the most difficult uh, job on this planet, which is trying to understand what is it I wanted to build. Okay. So this is my last slide, um, 2016 plans. Um, and this is just, uh, I'm just showing you a little bit from science related codes. As I said, development is going to accelerate. And we, these, this is still draft. We're, we're actually here, we've gathered this week to try to finalize these plans. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we expect uh, will start showing up uh, in the next year. So initial versions of all types of co-eds. Um, Image differencing with differential chromatic refraction mitigations, uh, calibration pipeline, where we're starting work on the solar system, um, and, and many, many others. And this is one that we're very uh, interested in and excited about, which is end-to-end -end system, system uh, end to end test system. So we'll be able to have a mini software LSST uh, data processing system uh, in-house and see how the whole thing works, hangs together. So I'm going to stop here, um, take a few questions, and then uh, let's uh, move on. Thank you. So you're going to release all these catalogs, where the objects are in the sky, but uh, if you want to do any kind of classic analysis, you also need to know your window function, basically, where the logics would be detected if they were there. Uh, so what, how do you plan to do that? Um, Can you repeat the question, Mario? The question is, where are we going to characterize the selection function? Uh, roughly. Yeah, in space and time. In space and time. Uh, the answer is yes. So we will characterize it. How, uh, the answer is TBD. So we're, you can expect you can expect something. Worst case scenario, you can expect something at the level of the mangle maps of the entire uh, survey. Uh, but we're looking we're looking into what's what would be optimal given everything else that we're trying to do. So that is that is a requirement. That is a data product document. Is something that we have to deliver. Yeah. 